Good evening. We're going to be doing a, uh, supposed to, I guess it's going to be a sequential study dealing with time, all during the meetings. And tonight we start before the beginning of time. So I have the privilege of introducing our study through time. And hopefully by the end of the week you'll understand what we're trying to do. I think it's kind of ambitious. But we're going to try to set the 1888 message in context. And tonight we'll be getting the context before the problem started, the problem of sin. And uh, we'll be going from there. How many of you are here tonight at an 1888 conference for the first time? Can I see your hands? Okay. About 25% of the audience tonight. Well, the, um, how many of you have already studied the message in books? Okay, good, very good. So you won't be totally new. Before we get started with before the beginning of time, let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you for this evening and for these meetings. We thank you for the opportunity to study together. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come now and be our teacher. I ask that you would speak to me and speak through lips of clay. Refresh our hearts, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. A father was entering the lobby of their apartment complex with his two-year-old daughter's hand in his when she slipped her hand out of his and said, just a moment. She had often said things that he was proud of, but that statement practically stopped his heart. What do you mean, just a moment? Two-year-olds don't typically think much about time. I don't imagine that they make plans for tomorrow or daydream about next week. Two-year-olds live just one moment at a time. They're not conscious of the passage of time or the impact of time. But before he realized it, or even paused to consider the possibility, time had entered his daughter's world. Time. You know what time is. Time is the one that rushes us from appointment to appointment. Time is the one who causes us to finish tasks before we're done. Time causes us to quit work on our masterpiece before its brilliance becomes obvious. Time is the slave driver that follows us all. And we say it just a moment when we need a time out, when we need a reprieve from the relentless pace of the day. And everyone has a moment. It's kind of like a bucket full of buttons. We all have a cache of moments. Some of us have moments that span decades. Some have moments that have dwindled to a few years. And some, perhaps, have a few moments left before the setting of the sun. Everyone has a moment. Everyone that is, except for God. 
Turn with me to Isaiah, the 57th chapter. How many of you brought your Bibles this evening? All right, let's go to Isaiah, chapter 57. Notice verse 15. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. We live in time. But the Bible says God inhabits eternity. Sometimes it seems he condescends to dwell in time, to interact with his earth time-bound children. But he inhabits eternity. This evening we're supposed to be talking about before the beginning of time. How much time was there before time began? Before the beginning of time, you're dealing with eternity. When we broach the subject of eternity past and try to imagine or discover what took place before the creation of the world, of the worlds, of the galaxies, of the universe, when we go back to think about eternity, if we're honest, we don't have the tools for the job. Anyone here take calculus in college? Do you remember integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity? Some problems can't be solved unless you take the long view, unless you look at minus infinity to plus infinity. But I remember when I first started in calculus it, and thought about it, it made my head hurt to think about it. Minus infinity to plus infinity. It seems that's the realm in which God dwells. And we think about it, and it's kind of fun to think about it, but we can't comprehend it. So why do we think on it? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. We think about eternity. Even though we can't comprehend it, we can't grapple it, we can't quite get our arms around it, but we think about it because God has put eternity in our hearts. When I think about that verse, I imagine an elderly professor trying to explain multivariate calculus or a boundary value equation to a four-year-old child. He puts eternity into the mind of the child, even though, unless he's an exceptional child, he can't comprehend, he can't deal with the equations, he, he's ill-equipped to solve the problem. But with a hope born of faith, the professor puts eternity infinity into the mind of the child. He has put eternity 
in their hearts. Eternity in our hearts. Is it a gift or a curse? What do we learn about God and the plan of redemption that we can't understand without taking the long view? There are a number of questions that come to mind. Did God know that we would fail? Or was that merely a possibility? Why did he make us if he knew that it would cost him the life of his son? God could have wiped out Lucifer all the angels, all the worlds, the whole cosmos. He could have, as it were, neutron bombed the universe. When sin occurred, and no one would have known, except the Godhead. Second Timothy helps us to answer question number one. Second Timothy chapter one. Verses eight and nine. Second Timothy one. Says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Did God know that we would sin? The Bible says he gave us grace before time began. God loves the sinless angels who do his service and are obedient to all his commands, but he does not give them grace. These heavenly beings know not of grace. They have never needed it, for they have never sinned. Only fallen beings need grace grace. And before time began, that would be at least 6,000 years ago. Before time began, the Bible says God gave us grace in Christ Jesus. I remember one day in physics class, our professor was explaining the four dimensions of space. Length, width, height, and time. But as he went through the processes of, of explaining this, when he got to time, he had a hard time <laughs> explaining time. He was so entangled in his thoughts and in his expressions and so befuddled trying to explain the time 
after class, I went up to him and told him, there are only three dimensions. Time is a mistake. God never intended for there to be time. And I suppose our frustration with time is because we were made, we were designed for eternity. And we'll never feel at home, we'll never be at peace until we get there. Jeremiah helps us with question number two. Jeremiah chapter one. Let's go there as we consider why did he make our world knowing it would cost him his son? Jeremiah chapter 1, notice verses 4 and 5. Jeremiah 1, 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Before you were born, before you were even formed in the womb, before you existed, I knew you. Can it be that what is true of Jeremiah is true of each of us? Before he formed us in the womb, he knew us? Signs of the Time, April 22, 1903. The servant of the Lord says, he knew us and he had a purpose for us. More than that, she says, we were brought into existence because we were needed. We were brought into existence because we were needed. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible seems to hint at that same thought. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head. Who is the head of the church? Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. The Bible says somehow, if we were to look at the big picture, if we could understand the long view, God needed us. Before we were formed, before time began, he knew us and he saw the necessity for our existence. We were brought into existence because we were needed. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, the Bible says, The Lord appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. The term everlasting comes from the Hebrew word Olam, that's O-W-L-A-M, and it means without time, eternity, always. 
So the Lord is saying, there is no time when I haven't loved you. I loved you when there was no time. I loved you before time began. Before he formed us, he knew us. And he loved us. Why did he make our world? And why did he make us knowing it would cost him the cross? It would appear that God could not deny us the opportunity to exist simply because it would be inconvenient. Although some of us have denied our children that very thing for that very reason. Agape couldn't do it. He couldn't deny us existence because he knew it would be inconvenient. He could have wiped out Lucifer, all the angels, all the worlds. He could have neutron bombed the whole universe when the sin problem erupted. Why not? Why not abort the experiment after the fall of Lucifer? The first reason that God hasn't ended the experiment is because of his great love. Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says, Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, he chose us before the foundation of the world. And having chosen us, we still exist because of God's love. There's no explaining it. Agape is mysterious. But since we know that agape never fails, we trust this experiment will end successfully. Someday, There'll be no more time, and we shall be together with God for eternity.